Hi everyone, good afternoon and good morning to some of you on the West Coast. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar today, How to Build a Business Case for a Calibration System. I am Katie Turner, Marketing Manager here at BMEX. Um, I'm located in Atlanta, Georgia. I will be your host for today. So to go ahead and start us off, our first presenter will be Dr. Peter Martin. He is the Vice President at Schneider Electric and has over 35 years of industrial control and automation experience. He has authored numerous articles, technical papers, books, and also holds multiple patents. Dr. Martin has been named a hero of U.S. manufacturing by Fortune magazine and holds one of the 50 most influential innovators of all time by Intech magazine. He has also received the Lifetime Achievement Award by the International Society of Automation. And in 2013, Dr. Martin was elected to the Process Automation Hall of Fame and was selected as a fellow of the International Society of Automation. He holds a BA degree, an MS in mathematics, as well as an MA degree in administration in Administration and Management, and a Master of Biblical Studies, as well as a PhD in Engineering, and a PhD in Biblical Studies as well. Our second presenter today will be Mr. Alex Maxfield. He is the Vice President of VMAX and has 27 years of experience as a qualified engineer. Early on in his career, Alex served as a specialist in power generation for rotating machines, focusing on machinery health and mechanical performance, especially vibration analysis for dynam dynamic balance and maintenance purposes. He also broadened his experience in the specification of control, test and measurement instrumentation, and quality management systems for production quality control as well. For the last eight years, Alex has worked at BMEX and has helped with supplying calibration management systems to the process industries, specializing in enterprise-wide multi-site solutions for addressing requirements for leaner, more efficient calibration processes. So between their two presenters today, we have over 60 years of automation and engineering experience. So what are they here to talk about? Dr. Peter Martin will begin by setting the Foundation talking about the value of automation and he'll discuss the capital value model automation versus control and then he'll hand it over to Alex who will give us a definition of a business case and you know how to create one and what those steps might be. So I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to Peter to take it from here. Thank you Katie. I appreciate it. It's great to be with you all today. I, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. You know, the value of automation is a subject that's near and dear to my heart, and perhaps the reason is I'm pretty old. I started in industry a number of decades ago, and when I started in industry, the digital computer and digital technology was just starting to be implemented for measurement and control of industrial automation, or measurement and control of industry. And at that time, the thought was, this will drive so much bottom line value that it's a no-brainer. Everybody has to invest in these control systems, these measurement systems. And yet here we are decades later, and I'm not convinced everybody is as excited about the value of automation as they were 35 years ago. And so I'm on a crusade to try to get people to realize that the value of automation is significant when automation is correctly done. But my belief is effective automation may be and is proven to be the most valuable investment any industrial company can make. But the key point here is effective automation. An awful lot of the automation being done today, honestly speaking, doesn't drive the value it could or it should because it's not being effectively done. And we have to take a look at why this might be why we're dropping short of the expectations, and how we can turn this around. So when we look at automation, it's important that we look at it from the perspective of the capital budget cycle. In terms of the capital budget cycle, there's a model that people follow when they're investing in automation and other capital equipment that's critically important. The model is based on the concept of a return on investment or some other similar statistic, whether it's 
net present value or IIR, they're all statistically similar. And the concept is when, a, when an industrial company invests in automation, they, there's a cost to that investment. The bar chart along the bottom of this uh, graphic represents the cost of automation. Price is only part of the cost of automation. There's also engineering, installation, implementation, and the ongoing operational cost of an automation system. And as you see the bar chart, as a system or an automation investment gets toward the end of its life cycle, the cost starts to creep up. That's because of spare parts, perhaps additional training that's required, whatever it may be. So we have on one side the cost of automation. In theory, if a client invests in automation, there's a, a benefit that goes along with it. There's some value that the client's getting, financial value, that the client's getting in terms of economic benefit driven to the bottom line. Return on investment, essentially, is the integral of the benefit subtract the integral of the cost. And most businesses measure return on investment only up until the point in time that the investment is paid off. Now, it's a very interesting model, and part of the struggle we're having in, with this model is historically, industrial companies have a very good understanding of what their life cycle costs are. They understand what they paid for the system. They understand what the project cost them. They understand what it costs to, uh, to operate the system and maintain the system over time. So that bottom bar chart is fairly clearly understood but the deficiency is that the life cycle benefit of most investments is never measured. It's estimated up front. When, when an uh, industrial company is going for capital to make an investment in automation, they estimate the return on investment. And they estimate it based on whatever criteria that they use. Very often the criteria is what is the threshold limit that will get us this uh, capital investment accepted so that we actually have the capital to move forward. So they estimate it up front. They set an expectation that there's a certain benefit that will be realized. But once the project is up and running, once it's going, very seldom do they measure the benefit. A lot of engineers I've talked to believe that the reason they don't measure the benefit is that because they believe the accounting people are measuring the benefit. But the truth of the matter is today's accounting systems are deficient from measuring the benefit of most automation investments that are less than plant-wide. So what we have is a situation where we're working in a capital value model, and in that model there were two components that need to be measured, life cycle cost and life cycle benefit, and industry is measuring the cost to some degree, but we're not measuring benefit much at all, which means automation in the last 35 years has been relegated into a cost with no benefit. When you're relegated to a cost with no benefit, the whole marketplace starts to commoditize, people devalue the marketplace, and that's unfortunate. Because as I said earlier, I truly believe automation applied effectively can drive more value to the bottom line than any other investment an industrial company can make. Now I'd like to pop into a poll question at this point in time, and if you could all respond to this poll question, it would be very helpful. How often do you measure the actual financial returns you get from automation projects? If you can select one of those radio buttons and let us know what your example is, whether you actually measure after the project the financial returns you get down to dollars and cents, what your return on investment is, uh, that would be helpful. We'll take a look at that poll question later on. Now, moving forward, as... Um, as I worked in industry, I noticed that a major shift took place almost about the time I joined. In the mid-1970s and the 1980s, prior to that, our whole industry was considered to be a control industry. We measured the process and we controlled the process. The entire functionality we brought to the table was control. When the digital computer was introduced as the platform for automation, then what happened was the focus switched from control to the platform. All of a sudden, over the last 30 years, most of the major things that have taken place in industry have taken place in the platform. The platform has expanded. Some new technology has come along that allows us perhaps to do something new. But most of the technology that's come along has come along in the world of computer science. 
things like expert systems, uh, color graphics, believe it or not, back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. Um, you know, the Internet of Things today, connectability, uh, Ethernet, all these things are at the automation platform level. The problem ends up being that the value you get from automation doesn't come at the platform level, it comes at the functional level, it comes at the level of the control function. That is being able to correctly measure the process and control the process at the best economic and safety point. And the control function over the last 30 years has received less and less and less attention as the platform function has received more and more and more. I mean, I think of all of the uh, interesting things that have occurred in the last 30 years, like computer integrated manufacturing. I'm not sure if many of you remember SIM, C-I-M, computer integrated manufacturing. There was a period of time where everybody wanted to do computer integrated manufacturing because you could, because you could do CIM. And the problem was when you think of what CIM actually was, it was connecting all the computers to, in the plant together and hoping that something good would happen. The reality of the situation is nothing good is going to happen if you don't use that connectability to drive more functionality. So one of the things I see going on in industry today is not a defocusing on the platform. We need to focus on the platform. We need to focus on the delivery vehicle for control. And the more that can be driven forward, the better off we'll be. But we also need to reemphasize the measurement and control function. And so you break down what we do into these two layers, the platform layer and the control layer. And um, as we go forward, I believe we'll see more and more focus on the control layer. So um, if we can go to the next slide. Historically, when we think of process control, we think of basic regulatory control, either that or logic control. That is, control that just basically controls a loop, a set of loops. Uh, you know, maybe 30 years ago, we started looking at advanced controls. In the past 20 years, multivariable predictive controls in the advanced control level. All of those things focused on improving the operational efficiency of the industrial operation. That's good. And the, the interesting thing about it was 20 years ago, if you could improve the efficiency of the operation, which was often measured in terms of reduced energy consumption, reduced material consumption, increased throughput, if you could improve those, you could directly translate the results of that into improved profitability. What's happened is, over the last 15 years or so, the speed of industrial business has continued to increase. It's gotten faster and faster and faster, and perhaps that was triggered by the deregulation of the electric power grids. That may have been the first domino and a set of dominoes that caused an increasing speed in industry. And as that happened, traditionally, business decisions that could be made on a monthly basis started having time constants that were shorter and shorter and shorter than monthly. For example, if you look at the price of electricity, not the consumption, the price of electricity, on the open power grid, today, that price in the United States can change every 15 minutes. You know, only 10 years ago, the price of electricity could was typically stable for months at a time, sometimes years at a time. If it doesn't change, there's no need to control it. As the price of electricity became more and more dynamic and started to become more and more uh, frequent, the, all of a sudden, monthly business management became insufficient for controlling profitability. By the way, the same is true for natural gas. Today in the United States on the open natural gas grid, the price of natural gas changes every 15 minutes. And many raw materials. If you have ever watched a base metals um, financial ticker, you'll notice that the price of copper can change multiple times every minute. All of a sudden, the business of industry has gone from being monthly or longer to being real-time, having some real-time connotation. So all of a sudden, we have to start thinking about how to deal with the profitability of industrial operations differently. Rather than being managing profitability, maybe we have to apply real-time control theory to profitability. 
And that goes not just in a plant, all of a sudden we're seeing entire fleets of industrial operations being controlled in more and more of a real-time uh, manner. So we'll see real-time enterprise profitability control. And as you go up this stack, the impact on, in terms of the bottom line results becomes greater and greater and greater. But one thing I want you to see, one thing that's critically important about this stack is it all starts with measurement. It starts with good measurement. You can't do good process control unless you have good measurement. You can't do good advance control unless you have good measurement. You can't do profitability control unless you have good measurement. The basis is measurement. And unfortunately, over the past few decades, I've seen engineers skipping over the basics, going beyond the basic measurement and control and trying to jump up to advanced control or profitability control. You've got to get the basics right. You need to get good measurement, good calibration, or this stack of control is not going to be in control, it's going to be completely out of control. One of the things that we've noticed over the years is when we go out and we do a plant audit and we try to figure out how to improve the profitability of a plant, we're shocked that 50%, up to 50% of the improvement can be gained at the base level. That's by fixing the basic regulatory control strategies, making sure that the loops are tuned, and the instruments are calibrated. I can't overemphasize how important that is to every industrial company out there. So going to the next slide, the impact of this can be huge. You know, when I start thinking about the fact that we've been focused on the life cycle cost of automation investments, we've been focused on that, that black bar chart at the bottom of the screen, and we haven't measured or focused on the benefit it's a shame because the value automation can provide when it's correctly and effectively done is enormous. Our experience, experience is that if you pay so much of a life cycle cost, for example, I have it on this chart as X, if the cost of this automation investment over the life cycle is X, the potential benefit, if it's done right, is a thousand times that at least. A thousand times that in terms of energy cost reductions in the plant, material cost reductions in the plant, and production value improvements, that is the value of the products being produced. If the benefit side of the equation is a thousand times greater or more than the cost side, why are we focused on the cost side? We're focused on the cost side because that's all we're measuring. So going forward, what we need to do is we need to be able to measure the cost of automation. We certainly want to continue to reduce the cost of automation, but we want to focus on that benefit line. We want to focus on that thousand timeline. And the way to focus on that is starting with the basics. Get the measurements right, get the loop tuning right, move to advanced control, move to multivariable predictive control, and then move to profitability control. You see, the excitement that was there 35 years ago should still be there. We're an industry that can drive value beyond what any other industry can drive. We aren't all the time. In order to do it, we have to reverse the way we're thinking, stop just focusing on the platform, start focusing on measurement and real-time control. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. And Katie, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Well done. I'd like to go ahead and welcome Alex Maxfield to talk about how to build a business case for calibration. Welcome, Alex. Great, thank you, Katie. Yeah, I uh, hope you can all hear me. Um, just wanted to say hello and welcome, and uh, also thanks, Peter. It's been a real uh, interesting and educational few minutes listening to you there, and it's a real great honor to be presenting alongside you. And thanks also to the ISA for hosting this webinar. I'd like to, uh, today I'd like to share with you some uh, slides now with regard to um, business case. And they really reflect some of my own experience in building businesses ca business cases for our own investments. The graphic you can see on the right hand of the slide really is a, is a sample set of stages of a business case. There is no right, no wrong, let's say, but and I'm sure many of you have your own processes uh, for your own organizations, but 
we'll come to that a bit later. Um, I'd also like to reflect on the word case uh, in the phrase business case because I think that's also extremely important because generally here we're going to be making a case for change. Okay, so let's start with a definition. You can see here on the first bullet point that we're defining a business case uh, as, uh, as stated there, but it's also, I think, worth, worth uh, adding here um, that we can also say that a business case captures the reasoning for initiating a project and the details of how resources are to be consumed. Um, and those resources really should be in support of a specific business need. Um, essentially, the business case asks, what happens if we take this or that action? And the business case should also answer in business terms, reflecting business cost, business benefits, and business risks. It's also incredibly important to consider the reason for initiating the business case. And I'm going to touch on that further on the next slide. Later in the presentation, we'll also look at quantifiable and non-quantifiable characteristics of a project and learn that sometimes it's not possible, not always possible or even always necessary to quantify all items in absolute measures of dollars and cents. Reflecting the third bullet point here, um, I think it's also uh, sometimes an overlooked point, but it's also very important to consider uh, why to change at all. Um, it might be that today's solution uh, either beats or doesn't meet today's needs, but in any case, today's solution is a really good benchmark, and any business case should show a comp reason to move forward. If we're looking at Peter's uh, 1,000 times investment return, then we need to show a compelling reason to move forward to, with that. Finally, the bullet point here on, on the first slide here is, um, I think also quite an often commonly overlooked stage in the process. And that's a wrap-up session after the project is completed. Of course, if the project performs badly, quite often there is a kind of post-mortem um, and, and lots of things are investigated. But sometimes if it goes well, then well, you know, sometimes we're just so busy congratulating ourselves that we forget to review the detail. And we miss really vital learning opportunities. Um, of course, today's webinar is about a business case for a calibration solution. So in the context of this webinar, a uh, solution is going to be something that addresses the organization's need to plan, complete, and document instrument calibrations. I think also it's good to mention at this point that that solution may also include the implementation of computer software of some type. And of course, that solution may or should make these calibration tasks more efficient. And also, if we get it right, can provide data for analysis to show that the project has met its goals. Uh, but sometimes a business case for software in particular can bring additional challenges in that you may have additional decision makers in the process, such as the IT department. Anyway, as, as we said before, the purpose of a business case will usually address some kind of business need. And I'm going to focus here on some hard cases, some hard business needs. Uh, I have a few there listed that I'd like to expand upon. First one here being technology. Um, it could be that your existing calibration solution today uh, lacks capability when looking at your own organization's instrument or control technology roadmap. It could be that that roadmap includes new types of communication systems, field bus, foundational field bus, or wireless, and, and today's calibration solution does not address those needs. Equally, from an efficiency point of view, it could be that today's solution does not meet your organization's goals of reducing time or saving costs. If we take a look and think about procedures, of course, um, it could be that today's solution is not best placed to support your organization's goals of business reprocessing, procedural harmonization, or simplification. As we mentioned also early with regard to business case for software, it's, IT here can be a really important stakeholder. And it could be that today's system also does not meet the IT department's idea of a system that can be supported by their standard process. 
Finally, that last bullet there on regulation and legislation is probably one of the most uh, important drivers for change. And it could be that today's system is somehow failing to meet those business critical requirements of legislation, be though ISO standards or EPA emission standards, uh, could be FDA if you're or pharmaceutical or life science related, uh, 21 CFR part 11. Which brings me on to an interesting point also that although it's not listed there, a hard business need that some people talk about is to go paperless, paperless calibration. And of course, that's, um, that's an interesting aim. Um, it should not be recorded as a nice to have because a paperless approach really goes right across all of those business needs above, technology, efficiency, procedural, IT support, and also regulation. Okay, so let's take another look at the stages of business case that we presented on the first slide. I have the first bullet strategy, and of course, you know, really everything inside an organization should, how, should somehow be uh, looking and starting with organization strategy, uh, mission, and vision. And it's important when we're setting out the goals of our project, and these being detailed inside the business case, to make sure that those goals are at least we try to align them with our company strategy um, or even initiative. Um, an interesting side point on that is that quite often inside organizations, there is budget associated with an identified strategy or initiative. And it could be that unlocking that budget, if your product is aligned to that initiative or strategy, could be a, a good step. Um, some of those might not be, some of those initiatives, of course, might not be calibration related. They could be associated with lean manufacturing or even lean maintenance. Um, but it's worthwhile having a look around and reading your competitive literature, speaking to the people inside your organization to try and understand what sort of initiatives there are around. Um, thinking about specification, of course, um, not necessarily inside the business case, we would expect that most people have a user requirement specification available before the business case is completed. I think one, one interesting point here, and, and maybe a little word of warning, is that you know we, calibration and metrology is quite a niche area. And we do see some people, and I think it's important to say, to be careful not to over-specify uh, a solution for today's process. Uh, it's important to weigh the pros and cons of a standard solution versus something that is bespoke or written for you. Uh, indeed, a bespoke solution may meet today's needs, but does it have a future roadmap? And of course, conversely, a standard solution may not meet everything today, but is more likely to have a defined and supportable roadmap for the future. And it's an important consideration. I think also when it comes around to the specification, a really key point here is to make sure that all of the stakeholders who are going to be somehow affected by this calibration solution are really consulted and make sure that you have their buy-in on, on all elements. Quite likely this business case also and really should present options. Um, of course, we talked earlier about uh, uh, the case for doing nothing. Clearly that's one option, but it's important to consider a number of alternative paths to meet your business needs. Uh, and of course, when it comes down to trying to make a decision on which path you're going to take, uh, one of my preferences is to use some kind of objective scoring mechanism to rate and to rank the possible solutions against the URS such that you have a clearly objectively defined uh, proposal. And um, moving on to the final three points, so I'm going to cover those on the next slide. So looking first at business benefit, we mentioned on the first slide there quantifiable and non-quantifiable considerations. Of course, if it's quantifiable, if it's something you can measure and quantify, if it's time or investment, you should measure it and you should quantify it. Uh, thinking along the next step now with regard to risks and benefits, of course, it's important that all risks should be identified. Um, there may be the risks to the business that cannot be quantified easily, however, but you should still try to estimate the probability and severity and see how those risks should be managed and addressed. Uh, one technique that I've used in the past has certainly been FMEA, so failure mode and effect analysis, gives a very good method of assessing these risks. 
On the flip side, of course, when we're talking about benefits, should all be clearly identified, but some will be simpler to quantify than others. Uh, and a benefit sometimes which we, which we list is not so objective, but I think it's important not to ignore it, and that's sometimes just doing the right thing. Uh, a good engineering judgment reason should be a great complement to your objective reasons. If we're looking now at resources, um, as a justification to commit resources inside your business case, you're really going to need to show that there is some kind of return on investment. And that could either be a financial return, or it could be a proof that you have met your business needs. Um, of course, we've also mentioned the fact that you should also consider the cost of doing nothing as that benchmark, uh, a very important point. And, and when we're talking about resources, it's also important to think that resources take many forms, and it's not just money. You know, people are an incredibly important consideration, and you should also consider that are the people, uh, resources that you need to execute this project, are they under your control? Even so far as saying, are these people even employed by your own organization? And again, that feeds into the earlier topic of stakeholder management is, is so incredibly important here. Thinking about the, the longer term also from a life cycle point of view, you know, often there is such a great pressure for return on investment in a very short period of time. And of course, that, that might well be possible, and you might well achieve that with a quick fix. But I think it's important to stress here is that, you know, do your homework. It's not always important to reach for the solution that is, has the initial lowest cost, or even it pays back the quickest. Um, a longer term view with a higher initial outlay may actually provide significant longer term return after the initial payback period. And also, if we're looking at life cycle, then of course future proofing comes, uh, comes to, comes to uh, the fore. Uh, take a look at what is changing inside your environment. How do you keep pace with those changes in your own project's roadmap? And how do you manage those risks? Moving on to the second point here, implementation. Um, you know what, we, we find so many projects, uh, including our own, that, um, and again, especially those that involve software somehow, sometimes they fail, sometimes not because of the functionality of the software or how well that software actually met your user requirement specification, but because they are ineffectually implemented. I think it's extremely important to plan a robust implementation methodology. Uh, try to use an approach, appropriate project-related approach. Consider workshops for situation discovery, current process auditing, uh, future solution mapping, gap analysis, and a clear implementation plan. Set also expectations inside your organization of what this project will or will not deliver. Moving forward to the approval side of things, of course, inside your own organization, most likely you have your own approval process. Um, take time to try and find out who is on that approval process. These are important stakeholders that need to be educated to your project's vision and benefits. Uh, and if you, if you do that work properly, if you educate them to these benefits, I think you, you guarantee the best chance of success of, of approval of that business case. Of course, change is, is inevitable here, but one thing that's, that often happens is that somehow um, project can, uh, can affect headcount. And of course, if headcount is at risk, at risk as a result of your project success, uh, it's important to consider whether that headcount can be found alternative positions inside your organization. Of course, the thought of losing headcount may be financially attractive to some, but so incredibly demotivating for others. So contingency plans for affected headcount is important. Talking about financial approval, of course, um, we, inside our own organization and outside, of course, we also see that sometimes a financial approval only process is in place. Um, bear in mind that your business case, your project could be reviewed and viewed by somebody like the CFO, and a, a very 
very straightforward, like Peter mentioned, an accounting rate of return can be used as the only decision-making criteria. Um, and this, is, this, is, this can be really difficult because it may be inside your organization that you have other projects competing for the resources you need, for the people, for the time, uh, etc. Do those projects have a higher rate of return than yours? Uh, of course, you mentioned earlier the importance of, uh, of aligning our project with organizations' strategic need. Uh, and of course then, in addition to that financially only approval process, then strategic initiatives are important. Um, I remember one time recently we had a customer who, who was actually had a business case denied at first pass for a calibration solution. Reason being is that when his proposal came up to the board, the approval board, um, there was a project in its way which had a higher rate of return. And that project, believe it or not, was resurfacing the parking lot. And imagine our customer's disappointment when his project was denied in favor of, of resurfacing that car, car parking lot. Not, not a great situation. Okay, so the last bullet on the first slide we had with regard to a business case review. Um, of course, we should, we should review that project and make sure that it's, or see how well it's met its objectives. And of course, if it did not meet them all, um, during the project, it's important to capture ideas for future improvement. Uh, your project, no doubt, will be an interesting journey for all stakeholders, and important to document what you learned along the way. Quantify what you can, summarize what you find, share the successes and failures, and document what you would do differently next time, and let others know. And I'd just like here then just to summarize a few points back over the past few slides, some of the things which really resonate with me as being important. Um, first off, don't lose sight of the reason for initiating the project. You know, it could be that one of your reasons meets one of these hard business needs we talked about earlier, be it technology, efficiency, procedural improvement, IT or IT related or regulation related business need. Important to align projects with company strategy. Tread carefully with your specification, making sure that selected options are future-proofed. Consider all quantifiable and non-quantifiable risks and benefits, paying attention particularly to the project life cycle. Important also to calculate the cost of doing nothing as a benchmark. Carefully plan the implementation process, as this will be key for the project to meet your, your business case goals and provide that all important return. And then finally here, to take care and manage your stakeholders to give your business case the best chance of success. Very good, okay, thank you so much for listening. I'm at the end of the presentation. I really hope it's been useful, and I'd like to hand back to Katie. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Alex and Peter. Excellent presentation and information. Before we jump into the question and answer session, um, once again, for those of you who join later on, um, unfortunately, Dave Hunt with Arizona Electric Corporation was not able to make it today due to some unseen circumstances. So um, Alex and Peter would have a bit longer with theirs. So let me go ahead and go to this next slide. And I'd like to let you all know there are a couple events that are coming up that are hosted by ISA. The first is the Food and Pharmaceutical Industries Division Symposium. It's actually next week, March 14th and 15th in Cork, Ireland. Peter Martin will be the keynote speaker at that event, so if you'd like to meet Peter in person, we encourage you to attend. The second event is the Power ID Industry Symposium, Power ID, that will be in June later on this year in North Carolina and BMEX is the platinum sponsor for that event. After Peter Martin's a recent book that was published, I of Automation, the best investment an industrial company can make. And we do encourage you to um, visit isa.org and you can type into the search box the value of automation in the book could come up. And um, Peter wanted me to mention that 
He would like you to purchase a copy so he can buy some Christmas presents for his grandchildren this year. All right, next, um, next and final thing is uh, we'd like you all to save the date for two events that are coming up later this year. They are going to be co-hosted by ISA and VMAX. The first is actually a technical conference for technicians that are working and performing calibrations out in the field. That will be on August 18th in Houston, Texas, and it's going to be a very hands-on present event. It's not going to only be presentations, but a lot of um, calibration competitions, who can calibrate, you know, a switch the fastest, and um, a lot of interactive activities with that. On October 12th, at ISA headquarters in Research Triangle Park. We will have a strategic type of event that will be formulated for management and executives to come and learn, you know, how they can shorten plant downtime or how to integrate um, automation systems. And there will actually be an interactive plant improvement exercise with that. So be on the lookout for an official announcement that those events are coming up later this year. Okay, and with that, I'd like to remind you all very quickly how you can ask questions. You can type them into the question box on the side of your GoToWebinar nav bar, or you can also raise your hand. Um, we do have everyone muted right now, but if we see your hand raised, we can call on you and unmute you so you can ask your question to the presenter and um, interact in that format. First question, any studies in the life cycle cost benefits in a heavy industrial chemical complex? Also, is there any data on the average percentage of automation costs compared to the total installed cost? All right, well, I'm assuming that's for me, so I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Um, I've never seen formal studies done that have been published on the actual benefit to cost ratio in a heavy process industries. On the other hand, I've been involved with a number of them where we've gone in and we've put in the real-time accounting models so that we can actually measure the benefit side of the equation. And the interesting thing is it depends on where you're starting. But if you, you know, I'll just give you one example. If you're just starting with an installed automation system and just trying to take advantage of the capability that's already in the, in the automation system by putting performance measures in, calibrating your instruments, tuning your loops, you know, getting yourself back to the, getting the basics done and getting moving, we're finding the average 100% return on investment in heavy process plants comes in at about three months. So if you, I mean, that's an incredible return on investment when you think about it. If the CFO hears about that, he certainly won't be spending the money paving the driveway next time. He'll be spending the money on the automation systems, on the calibration systems, on those types of things. And, you know, if you're looking at a greenfield project, um, and I'm assuming that's what the concept of your second question was, uh, the cost of automation versus the cost of the project, automation is well under 5% of the entire project cost. Uh, it depends on the industry. It depends on the size of the project. but the cost of automation versus the cost of the uh, overall project is quite low. And the benefit, you see, automation ends up being a supporting asset. It's an asset that supports the performance of the other 95% that you spend. But the benefit you get out of the automation is can be just enormous. So I hope that answers your question. But Alex, any comments on that, or would, does that cover it? No, I, I don't think so, uh, Peter. I mean, I, I suppose in the terms of, of return on investment, uh, it also depends upon your starting point and, and your, your current business need. For example, if you, are, if you have a system in place which is working happily and you're looking for efficiency gains, uh, then that return on investment could be 6 to 18 months, something like that, quite easily. But if today's uh, business need is something more significant, let's say um, a regulatory non-compliance, then actually the return on investment could be it could be measured in days because of the you know, the possible uh, effect of not doing things properly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. The next question is, how do you feel about the upcoming smart sensors, the front line of control systems and control? Alex, do you want to take that or? Yeah, I mean it's it's quite an open question. How do I feel about it? Well, you know, I'm I'm. Uh, <laughs> 
open to the comments. Yeah. I mean, we see, we see a lot of new build, I think, these days, which, which is uh, embracing uh, field bus type technologies, uh, whether it be Profibus or field bus or, uh, you know, as these systems now start to overlap, uh, new, um, uh, new uh, um, systems are coming more and more. Um, generally, these, these, if implemented correctly, can make the calibration task uh, a little bit easier because uh, on a field bus loop, um, every single output at various elements on that loop have pretty much the same value. So it's perhaps only important to measure it once as opposed to more traditionally the different uh, readouts or milliamp readings down that loop. So if it implemented collect correctly with the right uh, equipment in mind, of course, um, we would welcome that, absolutely. Yeah. You know, just as a side comment, there's a lot of discussion taking place. I agree with what Alex said, but there's a lot of discussion taking place in industry as to exactly where the intelligence should be in an overall system. And with the emergence of um, concepts like cyber-physical systems that are coming out of the Industry 4.0 work out of Germany, what we're starting to see is there's a debate. Do you put the intelligence in the individual sensor or do you put it in a cyber-physical package with multiple sensors? I think from Alex's comment, from a, from a calibration perspective, I think both work. But the uh, I think we're going to see a lot of debate in that area. I think moving intelligence out uh, into the field is a good thing. We can do a lot of good things with them. Exactly where you place the intelligence, uh, that's something that I think is getting a lot of discussion in industry right now. So we'll see how it all pans out. Very good. And there was a follow-up question to that. Do you guys have any case histories in the chemical process industries or examples that you could share? Of, of smart instruments or in general? It seems to be in relation to the smart instruments question. Could be. I suppose it could be payback related to the implementation of smart instruments, something like that. Could be. Yeah. Um, Mohammed, if you're out there, if you could clarify that question for us, we would appreciate it. Okay. My it might also be, Katie, something that we take offline. I mean, it's, it is quite a complicated uh, subject one, and if we're trying to share those, uh, that sort of um, experience, it could take quite a while. Absolutely. The presenters' emails are up on the screen if anyone would like to email them with any follow-up questions, or Mohammed, if you would like to contact them directly as well. Our next question is how open slash standardized are the protocols between various brands of documenting calibrators and software? I, uh, I think that's also a um, perhaps not a question for the context of this webinar with regard to business case. Uh, again, if it's a question directed at BMEX, um, if you contact me um, directly on the email address shown, I'd be happy to try and answer that one separately. Okay, very good. This next question is for Alex. Alex, how do you get past the if it ain't broke, don't fix it when ROI isn't enough? I would like to bring my calibration system into the 21st century, but the official cost always shoots down the project. Yeah, I, I think this is this is the purpose of a business case is you need to bring to bear the reasons for making that change and to as assess all of the possible uh, improvements that you have inside your organization. Uh, all the different stakeholders will have a different view. Um, go and talk to your IT people with regard to their future roadmap and their plans. The control system people understand what their plans are. Uh, make sure that you can find some really good hard hooks to, hand, to hang this uh, future solution on. If, if things are changing inside the environment that at some point are going to leave you with a gap, uh, then you're really going to have a bigger gap at that stage with a bigger cost to fill. It's important to try and align uh, your, your current situation and your idea of a project on what's going to happen in the future. Uh, we also have, we also have, again, this is, you know, maybe, I don't know if it's for this webinar or not, but we, as a company, also have a lot of experience in helping people to try and understand um, through the process of auditing and, and, and business reprocessing what can actually be achieved by changing the calibration business process uh, and looking at real savings in terms of time and money as a result of implementing systems. So again, it's something which is quite a complex question, but um, I'd be happy to be contacted after this to, 
to provide some insight, yes. Not an easy answer, I must admit, yeah. Okay, very good, thank you. The next question is, does Peter realize that his backdrop is calibrated perfectly for the magnitude of his ability to motivate? Peter? <laughs> well, I just happened to be strolling through London and thought I'd stop and start a webcast. Here we are. This is good. <laughs> notice, notice how the two vertical holes here completely frame my head. That's an amazing thing. But, but thank you. <laughs> That's a foggy London, just how I remember it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, someone is asking if we could get a copy of the slides. And yes, absolutely. Everyone that has attended this webinar will receive a copy of the slides. I will be emailing those later on this week. Okay, next question. What are the major problems facing I'm sorry, with new technology, major problems facing. And there probably is a word missing there, uh, major problems facing building a business case. Could you clarify that one, Jamie? All right, we'll give you just a minute. Let's just do a quick check to see if anyone has their hand raised. If they'd like to ask a question verbally, once again, you can raise your hand at this time. We will call out your name and unmute you, so you do need to have um, microphone capability on your computer or be dialed in. I don't see anyone's hands raised right now. I believe that we have gotten through all of the questions today. So I know everyone is very busy. Not to take it up any more time, I'd like to go ahead and conclude this webinar. And thank you all so much for attending. And once again, for Alex and Peter for their um, invaluable information and presentations. And one final request is that you guys do fill out the survey that will come up on your browser at the end of this webinar. And we'd love to hear your suggestions for the next topic. And thank you all very much. Have a great week. Bye-bye.